Okay. I think that should be good. Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Michael Markowski, and today we're going to be making another painting by another one of my very favorite artists. Perhaps my very favorite artist of all, and probably the artist that I am the most familiar with um, because of... Well, we'll get into <laughs> the, the various different things. Uh, that I've been working on related to this artist. So the artist that we're talking about today, his name is Tom Thompson. And some of you might be very familiar with Tom Thompson, and for some of you this might be the very first time you've ever heard of Tom Thompson. And that is, it makes me kind of excited if that's the case, that I get to be uh, the person that um, welcomes you to the uh, to the work of this great master who I consider to be the best artist in Canadian history. I'm certainly not alone in that. Um, his uh, he was really only productive for about five years. So in that in that respect, he's a lot like Vincent van Gogh. Vincent van Gogh really made, all of his art in the last five, six years of his life. Uh, prior to that, he was interested in art. He did some sketching and drawing and everything like that. But primarily, he did all of his art at the very, very end of his life. And same thing with Tom Thompson. Tom Thompson made some drawings and sketches when he was younger. He was interested in watercolor painting. He became a graphic designer and worked for a couple of, of the of the major um, design firms in Toronto at the time. Um, and through those connections at at Grip Limited, which is where he uh, one of the, the probably the most famous firm that he worked at, he uh, he met a number of other great artists and illustrators who later, after Tom Thompson died, formed the Group of Seven. And so many people in Canada, I'm sure, have heard of the Group of Seven. A lot of people think Tom Thompson was a member of the Group of Seven. That's not true at all. I'm, I'm, I even know some people are going to argue with me about it, but it's a quick Google search way to find the answer to that. But the Group of Seven formed in 19... 21 I believe um, or 1919 I can't, but anyway a couple of years at least after Tom Thompson died on July 8th 1917 although some people will say he died the day before or he died a few days afterwards nevertheless he died around that time and his body was discovered floating in Algonquin Park at a uh, fairly advanced state of decay, uh, I think uh, about a week later, eight eight days later after he disappeared on July 8th. So that's why we're doing a whole bunch of videos, one after the other this week, as we're leading up to the anniversary, the 104th anniversary of Tom Thompson's mysterious death. And we'll talk about that over the course of the next four episodes. Today, I just want to kind of get started and I realize that this might be an unusual time of day for many people who won't be able to join me live during the episode but um, uh, I thought it would be kind of a fun way just to kind of get this week going by painting a painting as you see on the screen here that I love I think these nocturnes as they're often referred to are I think some of the most gorgeous paintings that he ever did and uh, and it sort of also begs the question of how he did this type of a painting. Which, well, again, there's so many things to talk about. That's another reason why I wanted to spread this out over a few episodes. So I wouldn't have to frantically try to cram in all this information. I'll just let you know that tomorrow we are going to do two paintings during our, our regular Tuesday evening class. We're going to do a, a, the, a, one of his sketches. So this is... Probably, this right here is probably arguably his most famous painting of all. It's called The West Wind. 
I don't think he named it that. A lot of Tom Thompson's paintings were named after he died by people like A.Y. Jackson and J.E.H. MacDonald, who were, again, people who later formed the Group of Seven, but who were among his best friends and who helped Tom Thompson's family sort of organize all of this art that he had produced over such a short period of time and then helped to uh, place it into collections. Anyway, so this is we're going to do two paintings. This is the West Wind, and this is the sketch that he made, right? And this is the, the painting we're going to make today it was as also a sketch, and they're really about the size of one of these, these panels. Actually, probably a little bit smaller than this is what the original paintings were like. I can't remember the exact dimensions offhand. We'll see here in a second when we look at some of the the links I have here. But anyway, we're going to start here. We're going to do a, a quick sketch tomorrow, and then we're going to do the full painting afterwards. And I think it might be interesting to do the sketch and then the painting. And then on Wednesday, we're going to look at this painting. This is Round Lake Mud Bay, which I think is another gorgeous painting of his. It's not really one of the most famous. It has been reproduced and exhibited many times, but um, I just, the colors in here are just so vibrant that if we could only do four or five Tom Thompson paintings this week, this was just one that I kept coming back to. There's other ones that are way, way more well known, but I was just like, ah, oh, you know what? This is just so gorgeous. And then we're going to end on Thursday with this painting called the Jack Pine, which along with the West Wind are probably the two most famous paintings by Tom Thompson. And you might be saying, oh, well, they're kind of similar paintings, right? The West Wind and the Jack Pine. Why are we going to bother doing these two paintings? Um, because they are they are a solitary tree on the, the kind of the edge of the water. But they're both painted very differently. They're painted around the same period of time during the winter of 1916, 1917, shortly before he died. But I think it gives it, uh, you know, an interesting... Um, uh, juxtaposition of, of different directions that Tom Thompson could have gone in had he survived and lived for another 50 years or so, right? So anyway, before we jump all into today's painting, here's the painting, and then here is an outline for the painting itself. So if uh, uh, you want, you can print out this outline on your your home printer onto just regular photocopy paper and then you can transfer it onto the canvas and i'm going to show you how to do that very shortly here if you want to find that outline there's a link down below for a dropbox folder and you can click on that and you'll see all these different files hidden in the dropbox folder or not they're not hidden <laughs> they're readily visible but uh, you can see we are at episode uh, or 36 of uh, what will probably be 150. We'll see how long I go before I drop. Uh, but uh, anyway, here's the painting we made just yesterday for U.S. Independence Day. Jasper John's flag painting. There's lots of different art here for all sorts of different kinds of tastes. Whether you want something abstract, if you want something abstract... I would go for the Al Loving Cube. Um, let me see. Anything else really abstract? We have a few really abstract stuff coming up in the pipeline, including a Jackson Pollock and a Marcel Ferran. Um, uh, and then we also did a 40-episode course right before this as well, which has a number of other uh, abstract paintings that we did in that course. But anyway, and then you can see things coming down the pipeline as well here. Uh, including arguably the two greatest Canadian artists of all time, uh, Paul Kane and Cornelius Craighoff, obviously from a much earlier generation, the early 1800s, but uh, these two would be the, the sort of the grandfathers of Canadian art as we know it. Um, okay, and then Agnes Martin, who's probably, for Americans would probably consider Agnes Martin the most famous Canadian artist of all time because uh, she spent most of her time in the United States. In fact, it's, it's probably a lot of Americans think that Agnes Martin is an American uh, from Saskatchewan. She 
uh, is an ab there, she's an abstract painter. There you go. But a, but a very refined uh, type of abstract painting, not a sloppy, splashy Jackson Pollock kind of abstract painting. But anyway, we'll get into all that. Just before we, we go into the painting itself, I just thought I'd let you know that there's a private uh, Facebook group just for people in the class here. And I see Josh in the chat. And here's Josh uploading another painting for today. That's great, Josh. You're so busy. Oh, here's a couple. Here's another one I was looking at here. Here's Deborah. I think Deborah's in the chat as well. Here's a painting she did based on the Quebec flag or the the uh, it wasn't the official Quebec flag, but it was an early version thereof that had the sacred heart in the center that we did. Um, and then May, whose uh, version of the Superman painting we did, all of which are again there in the Dropbox. So let's take a look at Tom Thompson. Here's the Google Images uh, page. There's a wiki art is fantastic. They often have a great uh, collection of images, um, some more than others. Uh, but for the kind of the, the, the major artists of, that we've been talking about, they, they often have a pretty good collection that, that really kind of help give it a survey of his work. Now, Tom Toms, I'd say probably did about, I'd say about 200 paintings over the course of his career as an artist. He died at age, we'll see here in a second. If I remember, was it 43, I think he died? So you're thinking like around the age 37 is when he really began painting seriously. Um, and some of his earliest paintings are very gray and brown. Um, and you could argue maybe he just happened to be painting a lot on overcast days. But uh, it could also just been his palette or, the, or how he was learning. He was taking classes at what is now the Ontario College of Art in the evening it's and it's disputed how many classes he took did he take one class or like literally one like one painting session or did he take a full course a month long or two three months long or did he attend years worth of evening classes one of the interesting things about tom thompson that we'll talk about this week is that every time you find a fact that you think okay well clearly this is an undisputed fact about tom thompson everyone and then you start reading a few other books and you will find people will disagree vehemently and have sources to back it up about why you're wrong right so i am sure that uh, as this video ages there will be people who will tell me that ever pretty much every single thing i said is wrong and then there will be other people who will dispute those disputations and say that everything that people said I was wrong, I'm actually right about, right? So I just want to put that out there. That, uh, there will be some discussion uh, uh, about some of this. Anyway, so we're looking at some of these early paintings. Um, and I, you could say like early paintings, 1912, and then he's dead in 1917, right? So uh, he, he, one of the things that's amazing about him is he has a, a, a short period of awkwardness and then just takes off and what what helps is that he's surrounded by a bunch of other artists like a y jackson who had already become kind of well known in montreal before moving to toronto i think around 1915 um and so he and he painted alongside he shared a studio with a y jackson and sort of used A.Y. Jackson as a bit of a mentor uh, to help kind of learn a lot about art. Uh, and you could see really, I mean, this Northern River, this is one of my favorite paintings as well. This painting is a little bit more, it was is really kind of too complicated for our purpose. I should not have opened that. It's going to take forever. Let's just, while that's opening up, take a look here. Oh, age 39. Okay, so about age 34 is when he began painting. I also think it's interesting, if, if you look at a photograph of, uh, of uh, Pablo Picasso and you compare Tom Thompson to Pablo Picasso, there are photos of Picasso that look almost identical to, to Tom Thompson. And they are, are born around the same time. I think Picasso was a couple of years younger. I think he's 80, 1883 or so that he was born. Um, in fact... Get 
all caps, Pablo Picasso. Um, let me see, 1881, right? So, uh, born just a few, three or four years after um, Tom Thompson was. I got to find that picture of him because I just think it's it's so interesting. I did a, I have done a talk where I've shown both of those pictures side by side. Hopefully my internet is okay. Is any ever everyone having a okay ability to follow the video? Um, let me know if there's uh, if you're still able to comment and view what's going on here because my internet seems to be <laughs> staggering. Okay, um, well I'm going to continue on here. Uh, this is the the painting that we're going to be painting today. Uh, Northern Lights is in the collection of the Ontario or Art Gallery of Ontario in uh, Toronto. If you ever have a chance to go to that museum and see the collection there, I highly recommend it because they have really the largest collection of Tom Thompsons. They have a, a big wall that's full of these sketches, kind of all the way up to the ceiling, well, not almost all the way up to the ceiling of of his work. And then here's his catalog resume image. So let's see, this is. Eight and a half by ten and a half. So these panels are nine by twelve. So just a little bit smaller than these panels is is the size of canvas that he was working on. Um, you know what? I'm super. I just want to make sure that this is actually working. So just excuse me for a second here to see if I can load up. my own video um, okay doesn't seem to be I'm having some problems viewing that on my phone as well so We'll see. Maybe maybe I'm not online at all, and this is uh, I'll have to upload this separately. Oh, there we go. Internet is it working. Okay, I don't see anybody commenting. I see a few comments here earlier, but I don't see any new comments in response to what I was saying. So we'll see. Hopefully, uh, people are able to to watch the the stream. So let's kind of go into. So as I said, uh, I've, you can print out the outline. I'm using some carbon paper, which is double-sided. That's why the image is on both sides, the back side of my printout, and onto the canvas. And I'll also let you know that the that I've already done the outlines on the, the next group of paintings, right? So here's, that's Thursdays, here's Wednesdays painting, and then here's, the two paintings we're going to make tomorrow evening. Okay. So, let's put these ones aside. Okay, great. I see a few people saying they can, in fact, see me. And we are, <laughs> it's our live. Okay. So, let's zoom out a little bit. Um, and let's, let's, I'm going to quickly show how I did the outlining which I know is familiar to most people, but it just 95% of the people that watch these videos are watching me for the very first time. So basically what I do is I take one of these canvas boards and I put a little bit of gesso on it. Additionally, it already usually comes pre-gessoed and then I put a little bit of extra gesso on it, let it dry overnight and then sand it. And then here's the last episode, or a couple episodes of what we did yesterday. And then here's today's episode. So you can see what I do is I just take um, the, the printout, I tape it to the canvas, I find a pencil that I'm going to use. I use a colored pencil, that way I can see which lines I've drawn over and which lines I have not drawn over. Um, trust me, I've been doing this for years and if you just use a regular pencil, there will be things that you forget 
to, to draw lines on. And when you peel off the paper, like, oh no, and then you try to line it, line it up again and you'll never get it. Now today's image is relatively straightforward. You, you wouldn't really need to, or, or just wanna share. I do kind of do a little double check just to make sure that, right, and that's what it looks like. Pretty straightforward, right? Okay. Um, so let's dive right into this painting. So the first thing that I'm going to do, I'm... Yeah, I'm just gonna we're, we'll keep things simple. I was just in my mind for a second debating whether I wanted to mix a slightly different color than we usually do, because Tom Thompson, for the sketches that he made in Algonquin Park, those small paintings that he did on location, often from his canoe, so he'd often be sitting in his canoe painting or sitting on a log. He had a, uh, you could think of it as like a, a large uh, cigarette box that uh, I'm not even sure what it was originally. I don't know if it was something you would have been able to buy from an art supply store, which they didn't really exist back then. Often a lot of um, art materials were sold at like pharmacies um, in the same way that you, you can get like, you know, at... Uh, some pharmacies today, you can kind of get random things. A lot of, like, things are often, like, ordered through department stores and that kind of thing. Let's do this on this other little pal. Um, anyway, was, he, he often painted on plywood. And, uh, and that plywood, obviously, would be, like, let me just show you. So I often paint on plywood itself. This is, um, uh, you know, these little uh, boards that I get, and I'll, I'll take them and, and either at the um, at a hardware store or lumber store, they can cut them down to size for you. Sometimes it costs, you know, you might spend five, ten dollars per cut, but you can get um, a large sheet for probably like I probably spent. Like these are, what, eight, eight by 10 sheets of plywood, and, which costs maybe for a, a sheet this thin. And this is, I don't, I'm sure, I think this is plywood, not Luon, which is like a door material. Um, you know, let's, let's say even for a high end one, like maybe 60 bucks, 60, 70 bucks at, at the highest for a large sheet of uh, plywood that's that's thin and already comes kind of sanded because sometimes plywood can be really rough, right? So you want kind of the the smoothest uh, version of plywood they have, and then you if you, even if you got it cut at the at the store, at the lumber yard, or not the lumber yard, it might cost by the end 120 bucks, but you'll have like. 50 panels that you can paint on. So I'm just adding a little bit of water to this paint. And those 50 panels, you know, that can take you a while to paint on. And if you kind of break that down, 50 panels divide, like, divided by, let's say, 120 bucks is what? Like two, 250, 225, something like that. And, um, I'm just gonna put this paint on here, and that uh, would be roughly about the same price as as uh, it costs to get these types of canvas from the art supply store. The difference is is that you can get when you if you get the wood cut yourself, or you cut it yourself, you can have it at whatever size and dimension you want, right? Um, and personally, I love the look of panels like this that have that wood grain kind of coming through. I often will paint uh, without white on there 
which is what we're trying to simulate. And obviously, you're like, wait a second, the, the, you're, you're telling me this yellow is supposed to simulate this type of a color? Like, Michael, you're, you need to get your eyes checked here. <laughs> um, yeah, the, 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 the quick answer is yes. I, um, this yellow is intended to kind of simulate the color of uh, raw wood. Obviously, it's a much, much brighter color than, than the color of that plywood I was just showing you. The thing is, is I want to get this painting. We are going to cover everything with paint. And so whatever we put down here is going to kind of disappear. The, this yellow will kind of affect every color that it goes on on top of it. And it tends to make the painting look a little bit brighter, more colorful, more luminescent, um, which especially in the case of painting, the painting we're about to paint, this um, uh, Northern Lights display, I think is gonna work really well. It's, it might, we'll see how the difference. It just means that we might have to mix the color slightly different than it would have been originally. But we've been doing that all along. Anyway, let me turn my fan on. Whew. It's getting hot down here. Also, I feel like I'm a little bit out of breath. I, I, part of it, it's not that I've been running around and jogging and I'm, like, tired. I guess it's, there's, I have such, like, um, in, in, uh, an intimate kind of connection to Tom Thompson because every day I'm working on a comic book, a graphic novel that will be published uh, probably in stores by this time next year. And um, there's just, my mind is full of things to say. I could talk for hours and hours and hours about Tom Thompson. So it's like, where, oh my God, what do I say? How do I, do I, I got to make sure I say all the things that I've been thinking about for hour, for years now. Um, okay, uh, see, it's good. There's lots of people in the, in the, um, in the chat there. I, I'm surprised that so many people are, are tuning in on this kind of unusual time to paint. So that makes me very, very excited. Okay, so we've got this on here. That looks like it's drawing pretty fast because it's warming up in the studio. So I'm going to use my, this is going to help speed up the drawing here, but also make things more hot, which I might have to run upstairs and get a, cold pack for my camera up there. So let's take a look at the painting itself, and it's, it, we'll do a little detective uh, work here to see if we can understand a little bit about how it was made. So, where should we put that for a second? Okay. So the first thing that I see when I look at this painting is the amount of texture that's already on here. Now, that could be, I was going to say the wood surface, but I don't think, like, it reminds me of, like, chipboard, and I don't, uh, that's screwed down to the floor. Do I have any chip? Yeah, here, let me see. So, it kind of reminds, actually, let's put these up side by side. Ah. Do that again. So it kind of reminds me of this material, right? This uh, chipboard, but this, 
kind of thing. I don't know if it existed in Tom Thompson's time, which is, you know, wood that, you know, these kind of remnants and scraps, these little kind of shavings from the uh, lumber mill, and then they're all glued together into these sheets, and it's a, they're actually quite strong because of, because all the glue, this is like probably half glue, half wood, right? Um, but uh, that, that, that would be my initial suspicion is that they were made this way but now the more i look at it the more i think especially because i don't know if that kind of wood existed at that time i'm now thinking that this painting might have been painted over top of another painting because we see these kind of some of these blobs look like they could have been something else and that wouldn't surprise me like tom thompson was essentially living in Algonquin Park for at least from from around March to November of every year during those final uh, five, four or five last, especially the last few years. Anyway, he was there almost the entire time. He'd, he'd come back to Toronto. He had a studio in what is now known as the Studio Building which was built by another one of the Group of Seven, Lauren Harris, who's, who, for many people, is, is probably the most famous member of the Group of Seven. Um, uh, Lauren Harris was, a, was quite wealthy, his, or his family was very wealthy, and used that money to build a, a, a studio for his friends um, in Toronto. And you can go, it's not, you can't just walk in, but you can go around the outside of it. It's there in the... Um, What's the name of that ravine? Um, it's it's about a ten minute walk from. Um, gosh, that's gonna drive me crazy. Okay, um, well, maybe that's for a different episode. We'll talk more about uh, where the studio building is, and because the West Wind, the 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 final versions of the West Wind and the Jack Pine were painted in that studio. Anyway. Um, keep getting sidetracked here my apologies so it looks like he's painted over top of another painting there's not really a lot of uh literature written about this painting so uh, we're kind of flying a little bit blind here um so as for what color is underneath all of this I don't know, I, and I don't even know if he would bother painting uh, white over top of it. He might have just gone and just started painting right over top of the original painting. Um, but uh, so there's not. I don't know if there's too much of a point in trying to to discern the process here in terms of that early stage of the painting. What I will say is it just, it looks like he painted the background first. It looks like this blue up here was probably his first color. And then I would bet he painted this stuff down here, painted the horizon. And whether he was painting this at night or in the daytime, we'll never know. Uh, one of the unfortunate things about Tom Thompson is he, he died kind of unexpectedly and didn't. There's only a few letters, correspondence that he left behind, no radio interviews, no television or film or anything. So, really, all we have uh, with Tom Thompson is the paintings themselves and the few recollections people had uh, who were painting alongside him at different times. But. Uh, so I would say he painted that blue we have at the top first, and then he painted the bottom. And then I would say he probably painted this little bit more of a teal color over top of it. And then probably painted this bright lime green, looks kind of fluorescent here, right, over top of that. And then I bet you he came by with this other coat of kind of a muddy um cold blue grayish gold blue not grayish cold blue afterwards right so really this painting is fairly simple deceptively simple perhaps 
So we'll see how well we can do it. Now, so let's let's start mixing some colors and uh, let's let's get our palette out and put the paint on the palette. And I think I'm going to put all the colors on here, even though we're not going to use all of them necessarily. Uh, like, we're certainly not going to use any red just on its own. But we're going to probably... I'm going to... It looks like he did use a little bit of black. So we'll put a little bit of black in there. Although I'm usually loath to, um, to do so, because I like the look of colors that I've mixed myself, like a, a dark color that I've mixed myself as opposed to just using the um, the black itself. I mean, I have a tube of black right here. Oh, let's... Uh, right. But I don't know if... I, might, I might do those little trees that are in the foreground with that. And we're going to use this cold yellow to mix that nice bright green. All right. And we'll have a little bit of white there. Okay. Um, oh, lots of comments here. Let let me I just want to let's let's get into the painting and then I'll I'll take a moment to answer some of the questions I see in the chat. Okay, so the color that we're going to put in the background, it's interesting. When we have a, a simple painting like this, it, it almost makes the choices we make um, that much more important, right? Because if you only really have five colors in this painting, as opposed to some of the other paintings where we got like 50, 60 different colors in there, you're kind of like, wow, I got to really kind of... <laughs> <laughs> get those colors as close as possible otherwise um, it's going to be quite obvious that it uh, um, so essentially what I see when I look at this I see mostly a cool blue but it also looks like it's been like like this is a cool blue down here on the bottom as I said, um, this looks like it's a cool blue mixed with like a darker color, a little bit of a grayish color. So there's definitely this like cold blue, like a cobalt blue. And then this is is in our background. It looks like a cobalt blue with some ultramarine blue. So our warm and and, and cool blues together. Um, because if it was a like a, a a really warm blue it would be very much more purpley now we do see a bit of that in here but it's not the full strength warm blue so anyway long story short let's just people are like well just tell me what to do michael okay so let's um or should, let's do this right here so let's get some of the cool blue onto our paintbrush i need just a bit more of this And then, you know what, I'm just going to put the, some cold blue right here. And let's kind of mix this together. And we'll see them side by side here. So you see when we kind of, I don't know if it shows up that well on camera, we have our cold blue here and our warm blue here. By mixing them together, they're sort of, we're getting parts of both of those colors in the painting. So let's take this color and just see what it looks like Oops, on the painting. All right, so right now that to me looks a little bit too uh, warm. It looks a little bit too... I've got a little bit too much of the warm blue in here, so let's put a lot more of the cold blue. Just see if that makes any difference, right? So it's a little bit colder here. It's still maybe a little bit too cold, so what I'm gonna, or too intense. So I'm gonna take some white. And let's just 
put some white in here. Now, you're probably going to go like, whoa, okay, now that's off the charts. But I'm probably going to have to paint this background a second time anyway. So I'm going to take this color with the white, and I'm just going to go pretty casually. You know what? I'm just going to go right over top of of all of this here. You're just like, what's the point of doing the outline, Michael? Well, I don't, I, I don't know. Um, with a painting like this, like I imagine if he tried to paint this at night, if you've ever tried doing that, that is a really tricky thing to do because it's trying to mix colors at night whether it's by like a flashlight or a campfire is just it's a nightmare right you're you're gonna have struggle so hard to get any kind of uh to get the colors so-called right it would help if you had a, a a fairly simple painting like this with only a few colors but i bet you he painted um well it's it, he either painted it at night with a very this very simple palette or waited until the next day maybe even sort of just took a, a really good look at the northern lights and they're probably you know happening every couple of days so it's not like he's you know trying to remember something that only happens once in a lifetime if you've ever been to algonquin park you've, you may have seen some of those things yourself before Okay, I'm just going to take a little bit more, and you know, while we're right here, I'm just going to take this same color and put it down here on the bottom. You can see I'm using a big brush. I'm not have I'm I'm not afraid of of uh, making mistakes or anything at this stage of the painting. We're, I really wanted to to start this series of paintings with with a, a sketch that he did. So we can really kind of understand what a, an artist is doing when they're kind of out in the, you know, in the wilderness trying to paint like Tom was. Oh, let's back that out. Sorry. Oops. Okay. So I might, I'm probably going to repaint, well, we'll see. I'm, I, I may be fine without having to do a second coat of that blue in the background. And I don't mind so much the color that I've got. Obviously, there is all that texture underneath there from that previous, what I think is a previous painting. Um, you know, another thing that he might have done, if especially if he tried, he might have tried painting these at night and then he might have been like really excited at night woke up in the morning and looked at it with the when he was actually able to see the colors properly he was like whoa that's not what it looks like at all and then might have painted part of it out and, and changed things when he could see it properly like who knows exactly what uh, that experience was like for him painting in those conditions um, about four years ago I uh, went to Algonquin Park because I was invited by the Tom Thompson Art Gallery in Owen Sound to do an exhibition of about Tom for the 100th anniversary of Tom Thompson's death. So I went out there with one of my best friends, the, the guy who was the best man at my wedding, and him and I spent 10 days camping in Algonquin Park, canoeing around the various different lakes where he spent a lot of time, and we tried painting out there. And that is really tricky to paint um, in, uh, like, and we were using acrylic paint, which we're using today, which dries very quickly, especially in the middle of summer outside in the sun. It's drying really, really quickly. Um, whereas he was using oil paint, which can take weeks or months to dry. But we didn't get much painting done. Granted, 
we were kind of canoeing and going to different locations over like every day we would get, pack everything up and go so when you're canoeing all day and by the time you get to a new campsite you unpack set the tent tent up start cooking something boiling some water to drink all that kind of stuff you know it's the sun's starting to go down and you know there might be a little bit of time to quickly make a couple sketches but before you know it it's like pitch black and and then you're it's it's so dark you're like okay well campfire we'll have some dinner and then you're just like well let's just go to sleep next day the whole thing starts up again he often would camp in the same place for months at a time so that that was in if we were to do that experience again i probably would spend more time in one place and try to get some work more work done anyway let's get the bottom part of this painting mixed in so let's mix a really dark color that we can paint in down here so again we could just use black but i want to to just since this is also a painting class just really focus on like uh developing some foundational skills about how to get mix a color like that so let's take this warm blue we still got a bit of cool blue in here so let's uh let's take some cool red we mix this together we're gonna get a purple really our, our most beautiful purple that we can get let's see a bit more of that and then i'm just gonna take a little bit of yellow both the yellows a warm and cool yellow which is gonna really um now they're these are on the exact opposite side of the color wheel so they are going to turn this color into like a gross grayish um dark muddy color and if we want it to go even darker we can just add more warm blue here but i think i think that's not bad if i want i could also obviously add a little bit of black actually in here but I'm just going to stick with this color that we've got. And likewise, I'm using my big brush here, or it's a bigger brush. And let's just paint all of this bottom part of the painting in. I'm probably going to do two coats of this color and I'm not worried about this line here and getting it all nice and sharp really I just want to cover up the this yellow of the canvas I guess this blue could have gone down, could have sloped down there a little bit more. So maybe I'll do that with the next coat of blue. And then I wasn't supposed to paint on there. My goal here, this is still what I consider like our underpainting. I just want to cover up the surface. Okay. So I think what I'll do right now is I'm just going to blow dry all of the... Well, let me see. If there's any, can I get some... Is there any paint left here? So let's blow dry this, kind of lock it in place.
You know, another thing that I'm thinking about, um, you know, Tom Thompson was painting with oil paints. And the great thing with oil paints is they stay wet for a long period of time. And the great thing about that is, is once you've mixed up a palette and you're, let's say you're, you've been, you, 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 let's say you started from scratch, brand new tubes of paint and brand new canvas, brand new uh, box to paint on. You squeeze out those paints, and it's one o'clock in the afternoon, and you start painting. Um, that paint that's in your paint box will stay wet for, depending on how, how how thick those globs of paint are, like on my palette, you know, for maybe another week like that. You could still, without doing anything new to it, you could just dip your paintbrush in and paint. Again, it, give or take the humidity and the heat and all that kind of stuff. But it's entirely possible that what he could have done, especially if he was in the same place over and over, is that he could have, you know, let's say, painted this painting like this at two in the afternoon. Like he's like, okay, I've, I, last night I saw this, the color of the sky. Okay, I'm going to mix a really dark blue. And that horizon was basically totally black. And he might have painted it like that. It may even have just let it sit there and dry for a week. And then maybe he watched the northern lights, and then he either could, he could have taken this canvas out and painted it. He could have had those colors already pre-mixed on his canvas, and he would have known what colors those were and could have just quickly finished it off by sitting next to a fire. Um, or potentially um, he even because he he might not have been able to really see what that color looked like and and but he would have known earlier in the day what it looked like um or he could have just done it the next day like so so often you know artists w might prepare a canvas like this before going outside like Claude Monet painting uh haystacks day after day after day well you can get the like, rather than going out to the field with a, just a blank canvas and just being like what should I paint today you could kind of sketch it all out in the studio get everything ready get all your colors kind of generally mixed and then just take the painting that's wet or or even again it could be a few weeks ago that you started it and let it dry so that you could put more wet paint over top of it without those colors mixing and then just go and paint over top of that you know this is so interesting this is why i love doing this kind of thing is i've been working on this book for three years and it hasn't been until i'm just in this process of trying to actually paint like him where it really puts my mind into into that moment of trying to think like how would you actually do this right that's i mean that this may just this painting alone doing this is like solving so many storytelling problems for myself. Anyway, the stuff that it has. Anyway, anyway so let's uh, let's go back here. You know, I do like the semi-transparent quality that we have down here. And it almost kind of resembles what we see on the screen. But I'm just going to go back and paint another layer of paint on here. And as I do this... I'm uh, I'm not actually you know what last yesterday yesterday we were using a bit of um, of this a uh, heavy gel to paint the Jasper Johns flag you know what I'm gonna mix a little bit of this into my paint because I didn't really do this yesterday we, I applied it clear onto the canvas. I'm going to take... Oh, let me just show you what I'm doing here. Because what this is going to do is going to give this paint a little bit more texture. So, here's this big gob of heavy gel. Again, just so you can see on camera. This heavy gel. You could use uh, molding paste. It's I always think I should call it modeling paste, but it's called molding paste. So you can like mold something together. Right, I'm going to just mix this in here. Now this material goes on transparent, like or it is, it will dry transparent. But we're mixing the pigment into it. So what this will do is really help give the paint 
that texture that we see in the original painting, right? So I got this big glob of paint on here. So now let's just, you can see it has made the color look a little bit more grayish. Like it looks like a little bit more white. I'm pretty sure though that as it dries, it's going to get darker. And if it's not, if, if, if it uh, still seems pretty thick afterwards or a little bit lighter, then we can just do it, we can paint right over top of it. So I just want to kind of build up a little bit of texture here. And it's also what's going to, what's nice about this is it's going to hold the kind of the peaks. Because often what happens when you're painting with acrylic is you might get these, let me see if you can, can this other angle show it? Let me see. Let's zoom in. Okay, and you can see some of this texture there. go down to a bit of a smaller brush now you don't have to do this I just you know I always try to think like oh what could be something a little bit different that I can show people a can of that heavy gel costs like I don't know maybe 20 bucks at the art supply store which I don't know is either a lot or cheap depending on on your own situation but uh, you know I've had this thing probably for years because I, I just rarely mix it in with my paints This here, by the way, is that's my microphone. <laughs> uh, if you're wondering what that weird out of focus thing is. Um, okay. Cool. So we just it just adds just that little bit of extra fun to the painting. Just want to try to scoop up as much as possible and put in there. See, that really feels like I'm painting more like with oil paints now. Okay. Um, I think what I'm going to do is when you're, this material is basically like a glue. So you really want to be careful about leaving gel medium on your brushes for like extended periods of time without pa painting with it. It's okay if you're painting with it, but if it's just sitting there on your table for a couple of hours, it's going to harden and ruin your brush. So, um, so if we look at this painting, come on, what's going on here? Side by side. I don't know. What, what do you think? Do we need to mix that color or do anything new to it? Part of me wants to add some heavy gel into that color as well on this next round of paint. So I think I'll do that. Let's, since we're, we're it, I think it'll look a little bit weird if we have this textured area down here and then this is totally smooth. So I'm going to add some more paint and we're going to mix this again. Shit's.
that's that's a lot but uh, hey um, okay. this brush Where did I put my rags? I moved everything around recently. Hmm. Okay, I just want to get some of that excess water off my brush before I start mixing. And let's do this again here. It may have been a bit too much blue, so I'll put that to the side. Let's mix the color up first. So it's very, very, very blue. Let's take some more cool blue into this mixture. Let's take some white and put it in here. A lot of white I put in there. Not too, not bad. Let's dilute it with a bit more blue. Okay, and then we'll mix. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Oh, this just feels so slimy and goopy. This is also much more preferable to to like. Now I've like. This basically would be like maybe a, a fifth of a tube of paint that I would be using, right? Here, this allows me to, to use much less paint and substitute the heavy gel for it, which is going to have a better effect anyway. Um, so, oops. Okay, I need to go get my gel pack because that light just, or the camera just went off. So give me one second. I'm just going to run and get that pack. What can I put on screen for a second here? Um, let's leave this. <laughs> one second, folks. Refreshment for myself as well. Okay. Let's get this painting done and then I'll have my beverage. Okay. So I'm going to take this goopy mixture here. It is a little bit. Uh, it's actually about the same color. And paint over here. Yeah, so painting this way uh, with the heavy gel as opposed to just painting a ton of paint, I think w if you're, at least when you're using acrylic would be kind of the probably the most desirable uh, method. Because you have a little bit more control over what the finished painting is going to look like. Because it's as it, the heavy gel resists flattening out, it won't uh, it won't self level as as most acrylic paint will. 
try to just get some of those that horizontal line in there. And there's lots of something he was working on right over on the right hand side there. A lot of something going on there. Okay, so the heavy gel also will dry probably a little bit faster than big gobs of acrylic paint will too, so it's also kind of an advantage, because really this is what it's intended for, is to, is to give you more volume to the paint. It's sort of like a filler, I guess you could say. Okay, so now... I got all this, I have, oh, there's all this paint down here that I forgot I was going to do. Uh, that paint down there is, is this same uh, cool blue with a little bit more white in it. So let's mix some white into that blue. I think I just need a little bit more of each, and I'm going to use some molding paste again for that. Or, uh, sorry, heavy gel is what I'm using. My bad. Uh, probably don't need that much. Yeah, it's just use it or lose it. <laughs> Alright, sitting there unused for years. Here's my opportunity to use this material. I, again, I sh what I should have done is mixed this color up first before putting the gel in, because that gel has a, it looks white, but it'll dry clear, so it can be deceptive when you're mixing your paints as to what color is actually there on your brush. Um, so let's take this big gobs of paint I think I missed things a little bit there. Ah, let's just put this in here. If I want to change it, I can always change it. Okay, so I've got a bunch of this paint mixed up. I'm going to try putting a bit of the cold yellow into the paint and see what we get. It looks pretty good. I think this is pretty close to what he was using. So I got this here. Those 
actually a little bit brighter even, wasn't it? It's white. So you see it, it's getting, it's losing a lot of intensity as I added that white to it, which is a little disappointing. Uh, but I think what I'm going to do is, I think I might blow dry what I've got here right now before I continue on. Just so that, because I don't want too much of this paint mixing, or because it could just drive me absolutely batty and nuts. And um, I know this is I'm going a little bit off book here, but okay. So it's. I, I can always go back with that darker color uh, and kind of fine tune some of this, but I think I'll blow dry it uh, first before I do that. So what we've done here, we added a little bit of heat to try to help things set a little bit. It's not going to make everything dry. Everything's going to take probably another hour really for it to, to cure all the way through at least. Uh, but really what I just wanted to get is, is some of the wet paint on the surface to, to dry. Obviously, that's a little bit... Tom Toms is painting with oil paints, which are going to stay, quote-unquote, open for, for for weeks, potentially. So, it's just for the, our purpose to get the kind of really nice colors that we see in this painting. Like, these... This looks like it was painted over top of a dry paint. We don't really... It doesn't seem like there's paint mixing in here, which is, again, why I think he might have painted this over... Um, a few sessions, right? You can imagine that painting sitting next to him, next to the campfire for weeks and weeks, and he's just like, ah! Like, maybe it was like this. Maybe he painted kind of a, kind of a nighttime scene, and he wasn't too happy with it, and then one night he sees the northern lights come out, and like, oh, I know exactly what this painting needs now. I'm going to paint the northern lights onto the landscape. Right, so um, who knows? Who knows what he was thinking or doing? Okay. So I think I'm going to use this same color that I had on the bottom, and I'm going to put this. around the horizon. I think this color is going to need to be brighter. I think we need some more white in there. 
and more yellow in here. So actually, I'm just going to mix this a little bit off to the side here. Right now that's almost a little bit too bright in places. We could tone that down later on. Uh, but I'm gonna now take, I'm, now I'm gonna start going out into the top part of the painting and taking this, I'm just gonna take some of this yellow right off of my brush. And let's just sort of think about where, I'm gonna start right here. Right, and you can see that it begins kind of right at the, where this ends right here. Take this brush. So now I'm getting a big goop of paint on there, you can see. Now it just occurs to me, I see that that teal that he put down there in advance of this. So maybe we'll do that next. I should have done that first, but um, that's okay. Um, let me see, can I make, can I do this with the paint we have on here? We mix. So this is just basically the same color that we had in the background, but just a little bit of that green in the paint. So it's pretty subtle. Come over here. So that I kind of 
bungle the bid, but I'm just trying to, like, this is just how the painting process works, right? You kind of put some paints in here, see how, it, how things are unfolding. Okay. I like how thick this is. I don't usually paint so thickly. Um, in fact, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to let things dry for just a few minutes. The thing with like acrylic paint is because it dries so much faster than oil paints, is it's sort of like you either have to be painting very fast um, so that you're, you're painting with the wet paint in wet paint or you have to kind of go a little bit slower and let things kind of fully or mostly dry and then paint over top of it. Whereas oil paint, you can kind of do both. Um, it just makes for, it's just a different approach to painting. And so sometimes it can be, usually it's much faster than oil paints, but sometimes you need to let it, like, you need to let it dry a little bit. Otherwise, it can be really frustrating because it doesn't mix quite the same way as acrylic or as oil paint does. Let's just see the comments here. Um, Joshua, Maria is here as well. Deborah says hi there. Rick and I will join later and look forward to doing all of them. We just have friends over. Hugs to you all. Joshua says. Is there a jack pine mounted on the floor or wood? Is the jack pine mounted on the floor or wood panels? I see the texture in the back. Oh, I think we talked about that. You're, I think you were thinking the same things I was thinking, Joshua. Uh, Marie says, I wonder if this one can be done without sketching. And I think we answered that question too. Um, Sandy says, I see you. Gail says, we're good. It's working. Ace says, sound is good. Good photos. Thanks, Joshua says, I assumed he painted wet on wet and the biggest northern light is probably one long brush stroke followed by a line with another blend. Yes, I think, yep, I think we're, you're, everyone's, we're all on the right page here. Good, good, okay. Um, okay. So I think I'm going to blow dry this again. this let's do the teal first let's do that again wasn't quite super happy with that first mix that I did so let's just uh, do it again sometimes you know the paint just gets a little muddy you've been painting with a bit not surprised shows up on screen as well but I 
This is my kind of teal color. It's got a really nice glow to it. I don't I don't think you can really see it on screen, but it is definitely different than the color that was there previously. The previous color had it was much more kind of gray and dull whereas this one has uh, much more life to it. I don't like this. So I think what I just need to do is is uh, maybe just do some vertical lines here. So now I just put an extra little bit of white into the same color, brighten it up a bit. And then, oh, that's a lot of yellow, Michael. Okay, don't need to quit so much. Um, so what I want, I want this yellowy green. This is just uh, cold yellow and uh, cold blue together. Mostly yellow though. Okay, and I want to do a little bit of these, so let's get a bit of white on here. It's a bit intense, so let's just quickly wipe some of that off. So that was a little bit too bright, too white. So let's just kind of tone it down a little bit.
you know, one of the things I'm thinking about as I'm just painting this is I'm kind of struck by the confident mark making here. I mean, not surprising, but uh, he's just like just the the quickness of these brush strokes. It's kind of remarkable. And so I'm just kind of touching things up a little bit, taking like some of the cool blue, just mixing a bit of that in back to my color, and then I can kind of go over certain things. Maybe I should be using a much smaller brush here, I think. I'm just getting... Now I'm just going to use some white. Let's go to a smaller brush. So gonna just dilute that white just a little bit with a little bit more blue. Just so that if I have some stars, I don't have to be quite so dark, or so white, I mean. I think this is some white down here. Okay. Now there was this darker, or sorry, a little bit lighter area here. I don't, I'm debating whether I want to even do that. a few of these brushes off. Uh, 
Okay. <laughs> Maria asks a, a billion dollar question there. What is art for you, Michael? General question. <laughs> um, how much time do you have, Maria? Um, good question. Let me let me think about that. Well, I'm just uh, thinking about this next color here. I'm debating, just, uh, I'm debating, I kind of want to clean up this bottom down here a little bit. So I'm going to take this dark color, what's left on my brush, and let's see if I can just come in and around a little bit in here. There's not too much, most of this is dried up. Might have to mix. Okay, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix this darker color again. And then I'm going to use, I'm just going to lighten it up a little bit. I think. Well, let me just, i got to think about it. Um, So let's just mix up a darker color again. So this is my cool red and, or sorry, cool blue and warm blue together. Let's add some red to it, cool red. Let's add a little bit of warm yellow and a bit of cool yellow. Mix it up real good. And then, you know what, even right now, I think I'm going to paint the trees here. And I'll, I'll answer your question, Maria, I'm not delaying, I just, um, trying to, let me see, actually, before I even do that, I want to just finish this area here, which I just realized kind of left a little bit unfinished. Actually, it's kind of okay, but... You know, it's just, it's remarkable to me, like, how, like, his has, is much more messy, and, and yet, like, like, mine is a little bit, is more stilted, and a little bit more awkward, whereas his, he's just sort of exploding out onto the canvas, and it, yet it all makes sense. Like, that shows a tremendous amount of confidence. So, how about let's, uh, we haven't been zoomed in in a while, so let's, do these, it's so dark.
sorry, just brighten that up a bit. There we go. Okay, well, let's. Oops. <laughs> Marie says, I've got time. Okay. Um, so. This other thing here. It does almost look like he's scratching a little bit into the surface. Right, with the back side of his brush, maybe. that I'm using for these branches is actually a little bit uh, lighter anyway so you know what I'm going to take this That's actually kind of brilliant. That this little bit of slightly lighter blue that he's got here, because it it as opposed to just a solid dark horizon, it gives the effect that there's the light kind of coming up a little bit over top of the hill. In fact, he's even got just like a sliver, and I think this is just in the way that he painted it. But this little bit of of blue that was probably on the edge of his paintbrush. I'm trying. I will add a touch of black to my palette now. And I'm going to take this little bit of black, not too much, like, in fact, that's quite a lot, and just mix, get some of this together, and just mix.
So I'm taking some of this black and just carrying it across. Or it's, it's not just pure black, there's other colors mixed in, but... Cool. Okay. Um, now I'm going to take my dark color, maybe with a little bit of black, and let's uh, let's go back in to the painting. Okay, so now we're looking for I think it's somewhere about here. relatively thin and we've got this sweeping line Okay. And then let's go all the way to the other side here where we've got these other trees. Much smaller over here. Let's move this. Just kind of getting a little bit into this area right below here. Okay. So let's zoom back out and just think for a second about these two paintings side by side. Now a few things. I really like the in his version the way that the paint kind of spread out here versus mine. Part of that is 
just the quickness that he did it, right? I kind of went over that brush stroke a few times. You can see in his painting the level of confidence he had. Like, that is maybe two strokes, maybe just one brush stroke that he did going up there, which can you imagine, right? Like, you have, you've got all this ready, and then you just go one big brush stroke right up like that. So, I'm not... I, I've already got this that on the canvas. I can't kind of go back. I mean, I guess I could paint it out. I'm not going to. So my thoughts are like, okay, can I simulate a little bit of that? A, just give it a little bit of that effect. As so it's not one big kind of tower, but a little bit of... So what I want to do is I'm just going to take a bit of the color that's kind of similar on my palette. And I'm just going to kind of separate it a little bit. So let's just take a quick... Okay. Um... So I'm just trying to get a bit of these... A bit of that look... Obviously, it's not nearly the same thing, but... And I like the that bright color on the outside edge there. So I'm just going to take some white and yellow, but mostly white. Because his is still kind of brighter than mine in certain places, so... So it's just kind of little touch-ups now, trying to get a little bit more of that vibrancy, that white in there. Um, clean this paintbrush off a bit. if it's going to get like appreciably better over the next fumbling if I continue
So this is basically just some cool yellow on my dirty paintbrush. Um, So this is definitely not what he did, right? I'm just trying to simulate a little bit of of that of a brush kind of. I'm sort of faking out a, a brush stroke, really. Um, It's definitely I, I, my area down here is much brighter than his. That up there. It's just. I don't know. I think I think I can I, I can live with it for sure. Is it exactly like the original? No. Um because I, I think what I what I really appreciate about his painting is the the extreme confidence and the there's almost like a bravado in the way that it's painted, right? Like I'm sure he painted his painting faster than I painted mine. I'm convinced of it 100%. Um, now it's possible that he tried painting this painting 20 times and he painted it and maybe wasn't happy with it. Maybe he painted them at night and woke up next day, wasn't happy with it, left it, let it dry. And then was like, you know what? He was a bit of a drinker, right? How much he had to drink when he was off and for months on end in the middle of the wilderness is debatable. But he might have just been like, ah, I'm just going to paint over it and do this. <laughs> um, so he, and he's looking at the, at this sky every night. He's looking at it while he's in the canoe during the day. And, you know, that gives him a lot of opportunity to kind of really observe and think about the colors and the colors he wants to use. Um, which actually makes his job in some ways easier than mine, because it's like I'm trying to put myself back in his place, trying to mix these colors. It's it's um, it's tricky. It's it's actually and sometimes it's trickier to reproduce the painting than it is to do it the first time. Um, and what's kind of unfortunate is I I imagine he was making a sketch like this. What is Got little things flying all over. Um, I imagine he was making a sketch like this, thinking, oh, okay, when I get back to Toronto, I'm going to make a big version of this, which he did with the West Wing, or West Wind, <laughs> what he did with the West Wind and uh, Jack Pine, Northern River, a bunch of his paintings, he would make little sketches like this, go back to the studio in the winter, 
and then paint those paintings. So what's tragic is that he made this, let's say, in, I don't know, maybe um, March, April, May, J June, somewhere around there when he got to Algonquin Park. And then he died. And so I don't, I, I don't know if this painting was found uh, on his purse or in... He was, he sometimes also, he didn't always camp in Algonquin Park. Sometimes he stayed uh, at a lodge that was called Mowat Lodge that was rented to him by Shannon Fraser, who some people think was the person who may have killed Tom Thompson. Maybe Tom Thompson was murdered and maybe that was the guy who murdered him. So he had kind of a room in this, uh, what used to be a, like a um, the, the home for loggers because Algonquin Park, when Tom Thompson was there, was basically completely clear-cut, right? If you've ever been there now, it looks like the most pristine, untouched wilderness. It's, it's, uh, it's, it, you know, it's, a, it's what, maybe three hours north of Toronto, so it seems like you're just in the middle of nowhere. But, you, but what I think many people don't realize is that when Tom was there, it was like a barren wasteland. It looked like an atomic bomb had gone off. If you've ever seen like um, a clear-cut forest, that's what had happened to Algonquin Park. And where Tom, this Mowat Lodge, where Tom Thompson often stayed when he wasn't camping in the middle of, of nowhere in Algonquin Park, um, was the home for a, a, one of the logging companies and where hundreds of, of well, not hundreds, maybe... 50 loggers would stay at night when they weren't on the, uh, the working chopping down trees and stuff and then they would after they clear cut that area they just move on to a different area and then once that whole area was just completely gone uh, so there's photographs of that area and it just looks like the the landscape of the moon so you could see like when you're looking at this there's not really that many trees and what there is here just look like stumps and and there was also fires that would often run through an area like that. Anyway, why am I talking about that? Oh, because when he died, he had, you know, his family, his brother George went into the cabin and collected the stuff that he had left over. And there was some suspicion that Shannon Fraser had gone into Tom's uh, room and taken some things out. Uh, anyway. That's a whole other thing that you can read about in, in my graphic novel when it comes out. Um, okay, so I think this is... I think I'm, I'm happy with that. You know, it's it's one of those things that we will see later. You know, I'm, I'm one of those persons that... I'm not the biggest fan of texture on the canvas. Um, so this is going to drive me a little bit nuts. But I was asking, okay, actually, this is nowhere near the amount of texture that was on the original. So I'll just keep that in the back of my mind. Um. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let's. Uh, maybe. Uh, what should I? Um, looking at the comment here, um, Heidi says this is exciting. I will do it later as the second dose of the vaccine. Yes, as I had this. Oh, yeah, as the second dose of vaccine yesterday has sent me to bed. Happy painting, Michael, and everyone. Well, I hope you feel better, Heidi. Congrats on getting your second vaccine. I don't know when I'm scheduled. Probably, I don't know, it could be a month from now. I don't know. Um, yeah, so just kind of lastly, maybe let's look at, at his painting as opposed to my version of it because maybe other people are still painting and want something to refer to on the screen. Um... <laughs> so Marie's question, what is art for you? What I would say, uh, I guess, you know, it's like, what is art? Art is, um, is a kind of, of human expression and different artists have different reasons for expressing themselves just as, as regular people have, uh, you know, as everybody else has a reason for expressing themselves. Like, I've got a two-year-old daughter taking a nap right now, and she sometimes poops in her diaper while she's sleeping and expresses herself with for, with crying, right? And, um... I use art to express 
um, the things that are most important to me, right? And when we're doing this class, these are the artists that are most important to me. And also the artists that I really think should be most important to everybody else, that I really think are really, really important artists. Um, some that are, people are already very familiar with, like Tom Thompson doesn't need my help to become more well-known. He's just like we're going to be doing a, a four days of painting Van Gogh uh, later this month to celebrate the anniversary of Van Gogh's death, right? Um, those artists don't need my help, but um, I do want to celebrate them and also give people an opportunity to learn about painting by painting, walking a little bit in their footsteps. Just like earlier today's episode, like it, I had some big light bulbs go off as I was painting this and trying to really understand how he made the painting really made me really appreciate uh, the kind of situation that he was in. So I, so I use painting for expressing my own um, thoughts and feelings um, but I also use it as a way of understanding other people's thoughts and feelings. Uh, like doing this, I'm understanding a lot more about Tom Thompson as an artist and, and some of the, the uh, uh, difficulties he would have had making these kinds of paintings. Um, I think you know what's interesting about painting is is it's this is it's not a necessarily direct way of communicating. Like right now, I'm I can communicate directly to you through language, right? And um, and if I say, oh, I'm not feeling very well. I think I ate something. Like that's you understand, right? When we see um, Heidi who says, you know, like I just had the second vaccine. And I'm not feeling well. That's a pretty clear, you know, we understand that expression of her feelings and emotions, right? Um, whereas painting is a little, is much more, or at least it can be, there's certain, it can be um, a little bit more opaque to understand exactly what the artist is saying, right? Like Heidi could make a painting of, of uh, I don't know, a uh, of herself sick laying on the couch, and we would go like, oh, like, oh, I, can, I know what it's like to feel that way. But she could also do a painting that is like all red with some quick dashes of yellow on there. And she might say, that represents how I feel right now. Like, oh, just kind of a little bit nauseous, right? And other people would be like, really? That's, I don't, I don't I'm not sure I, I, I mean, I, it's beautiful, but I don't, I don't, wouldn't be the first thing I would think of as nausea, right? And other people would be like, oh. Oh, that's exactly how I felt after I got my vaccine. I really feel that, like, ooh, that, the intensity of those colors. Um, I think, like, art is is a great tool for helping us, like, um, uh, deal with, like, our emotions. Like, generally, I feel really happy after I make a painting. I feel like, oh, man, that was, I feel, like, really, uh, in, like... It's a great confidence builder, but then there's other times where I've it's like crushing. You're like, oh my god, I just like I spent three or four hours painting this thing, and it's like, what am I doing with myself and my time and my life? Like this is a, a, a miserable like experience. But the more and more I paint, the the less and less I have those those kind of crushing experiences. So it's a great way for me to. Um, to build self-confidence to especially the times like you know where I'm not feeling I might be depressed or sad or lonely or whatever when I have my own art up on the wall I can look at it and go like hmm well you know I guess I'm not a complete loser I've done I, I, man I did that painting huh huh I guess I guess I, I I can do things with my with myself with my life, and that's like that that is really important, especially for some people who really struggle with like depression. Is just having something out there that makes you feel like you can do something, 
that you can provide some value to others or even just yourself, just that little bit of, of uh, self-confidence, the up uplifting. Um, or that you can, uh, like I think, like making a, a like it, I often procrastinate just like a lot of other people, but doing this feels a lot better than sitting on my couch looking at just random videos on YouTube of cats playing piano. It's like, oh, that's funny, but wow, that was just two hours of my life just went by. Whereas this, it's like, okay, I've, two hours went by, but wow, I created something. I can walk away and I can put this on my wall or maybe I can sell whatever I've created or give it to somebody as a gift. All of it, like, there's a great book called The Gift and I can't remember who, the author of it, but it's all about art as a gift that we give one another. And I think one of the, I can't remember, I don't know if they even talk about it in the book, but I often think of like art as a gift that I give myself, right? That I'm, if I, I'm carving, to, like right now I'm paying for somebody to be upstairs to take care of our daughter who's asleep, right? But if our daughter would happen to wake up, there's somebody who can come and take care of our daughter, right? So I'm paying somebody to be there while I'm here with you guys right now, um, uh, because of how important this feels to me that like that um, that that money that that we're spending t to hire somebody is is well spent because this feels like this is if I wasn't doing this like like I don't know what uh, um, I can't really think of anything that would would bring me that amount of like um of happiness or this amount of joy and happiness to see something like i i often i'm sitting on the couch often after the end of these things just um by myself just looking at the painting and thinking like wow that was a blank canvas like three hours ago like literally blank canvas and now it's a one of my favorite paintings i've ever seen and I've painted it. I didn't just go to the store and print it out, but I painted it. And that is like, what? Like it's very, very empowering, and it gives me a sense of agency.